Finding a job and having a disability is hard. No, like, it's really hard. Disability unemployment rates in Australia are nearly double the amount of our able-bodied counterparts. You can have all the skills for the job, highly qualified, and regardless of this, if you have a disability, the mountain we have to metaphorically climb to be accepted beyond that disability in 2022 continues to be steep. Why? We're going to talk about it in this episode. Hi, my name is Fat. I'm the Employment Services Manager at Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. Um, I've been working in disability employment for over seven years. Hi, um, I'm Dominica. I'm the Employment Coach at uh, Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. My background is a little bit more in um, areas of counselling, case management and psychoeducation, both from my uh, professional background, uh, but also partly because of my personal background. Uh, I live with cerebral palsy and uh, I had to navigate through um, employment journey myself. We talk about the obvious misconceptions, how that feeds into the hesitation that a lot of employers have when hiring somebody with a disability, how employers can better themselves to be a more inclusive workplace, help people with disabilities climb the career ladder, and how COVID has forced people to start looking at what employment means in a different light. Oh, look, it's uh, it's a really challenging landscape, Susan. Um, I think if we just look at a few really raw basic stats, we can see that unemployment at the moment uh, in Australia for people without disabilities is uh, sitting around 4%. The scary stat for me is that it's more than double um, that, uh, sitting around 10, 11% for people with disabilities. If you take that a little further and you consider the rate of unemployment for people with more severe disabilities, that's almost four times the 4% rate at around 15 to 16%. So for me, um, it just paints a picture that uh, all is not um, going well for, you know, the employment prospects for people with disability. And would you say that that's uh, metropolitan? Would it be rural communities or is this just across the board in Australia? With employment opportunities, what you'll find is that in metro areas, um, you're going to find more opportunities in general because there's a wider spectrum of the types of jobs available, the types of companies that exist. But when you spread over into the more regional areas, you you tend to find different challenges. These can be logistics, but also when you look at the types of companies and the types of work that is available in regional areas, you tend to find more manual jobs. Um, and more manual employers. So obviously that can present immediate challenges for someone who, for example, is in a wheelchair, who has a physical disability and and certainly people with more severe physical disabilities are going to be more challenged to find employment in that kind of sector. Do you think that there's a different mindset for somebody who's had their disability for their whole life entering into the workforce to somebody who's maybe had a traumatic injury straight away to somebody who's already like had a traumatic injury 10 years ago? Have you noticed any differences in how people are perceiving themselves or perceiving employment? And this is a this is a big question, and uh, you know I I want to be able to answer it uh, in as inclusive way as possible because obviously I cannot speak for everyone. Everyone is different, and you know everyone's experience is different. Um, but I think uh, you know the uh, the main sort of difference that jumps out at me. You know, very early on, I knew, uh, you know, as a child, I knew that there were some jobs that I wouldn't be considering. Uh, I knew that I will not be a professional dancer. It doesn't matter how much I would train. <laughs> you know that just wasn't that just wasn't an option. Um, so I had I had many years of that kind of uh, reality check of what's what are my dreams and what I actually like, what I enjoy, but also what's realistic. Uh, you know what's uh, what's going to actually work for my body. And you know overall, I think it's important to know that. With any disability, whether it's uh, whether it's um, acquired or uh, whether someone was born with disability, that's there is still a level of of grief and loss and a grief and loss journey that people go through, and that just looks different for for different people, and it happens at a different time. And I think for someone who may have been fully able body and may have had the perfect job perhaps you know and and acquired a disability at some time in their life and and now is looking at very different options 
that's potentially a very significant, very difficult grief journey that they need to be aware of and hopefully they have the support um, that they need, uh, you know, in their own um, grief and trauma journey. But there is, you know, there is definitely a lot of similarities in terms of having to take into consideration what's what's possible, but also what's exciting. And that's, I guess, what I like about, uh, or one of the things that I like about what we do is, yes, we are aware of disability. Yes, we are aware of, you know, a specific person's limitation and uh, limitations, and we're not, you know, ignoring that. But we're looking at what's possible. We're turning it into what th- what is exciting for this person. You know, I remember being sort of entering adolescence and and having this meeting with um, this um, person who was considered an expert of some sort. <laughs> I wouldn't know their uh, their title now. Like it, it's been quite a while ago. Um, but basically, you know, this person in my eyes back then and in the eyes of my parents was considered this expert on cerebral palsy, even though clearly he didn't live with it. I remember him at one stage sharing some ideas of of some of the work that um, I would or wouldn't be able to do, um, you know, once I finished school. And he listed quite a few roles that he thought were not were not a good option. And, and some of that I understood, you know, if it would actually um, create a lot of strain on my body, that was not not a great option. I, I knew that climbing a ladder would really not be a great thing and trying to balance things, you know? I, I knew that. I was, what? Um, yeah, I know, right? It didn't come as a shock. Um, but what was surprising to me at that time was he then moved on to mentioning some roles that he thought uh, were a good option. And while there was nothing negative about these roles, there was also nothing inspiring for me about these roles, you know? They were kind of somewhere in a background uh just just be quiet get out of everyone's way kind of kind of roles there was not a lot of it they didn't take into consideration my strengths they didn't take into consideration my interest it was just oh yeah this this could happen and none of the roles that he actually did mention were any roles that, where um people would have a level of influence or leadership or uh you know making a difference in people's lives and I thought fortunately enough I was at the age when I was entering that um uh that adolescence and I had enough of a critical thinking developed to actually go internally (laughs) didn't have didn't have enough um enough confidence to challenge him but internally I thought really is that all that you think I'm capable of because really that's uh you know I'm capable of so much more Uh, then what are you giving me credit for? And the fact that my body doesn't work the same way as yours does really doesn't um, stop me or shouldn't stop me. Um, And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very important to acknowledge that yet again, coming back to those perceived barriers because they are very real because it's, it's very difficult to notice. And sometimes we can put them put those perceptions, those um, those limitations on ourselves. And, you know, I sometimes wonder how many roles I didn't apply for or other people didn't apply for because they didn't quite know where to start uh, or they thought, oh, there must be someone who can do that, you know, who can do that better or someone who can do that job full time and, and I need some, you know, some time off. I need to be working part time. So challenging those perceptions takes time. It really takes time. And for me, uh, you know, fortunately enough, I had a very supportive family and supportive uh, supportive community around me. And a lot of the time, um, the way I, I grew up and the way I saw things, it wasn't about making things easy. It was about making things possible. You know, very early on, I actually decided to... Um, to migrate to Australia. I was quite young at the time and it was an extremely scary, (laughs) scary journey. Um, But having said that, you know, like I had people, fully able-bodied people hearing some of my story and some of the things that I have achieved in my personal and uh, professional life. And they were actually quite surprised because 
they wouldn't have, uh, you know, they wouldn't have the confidence or they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't know where to start. They wouldn't necessarily make that decision. And I was quite happy to know that my disability is just part of who I am. It's something that I need to work with. Uh, it's not something that I'm allowing to, you know, stop me from pursuing my goals. I distinctly remember my mum having a conversation with me in year 11 where she sat me down. And she was like, your friends are going to find jobs that you can't have. So you're going to have to make a decision as to what it is you want to do because you're not going to be able to have the work that they have, which is such an insane thing to have to like get ready for. But I mean, I guess that's all part of the support, right? It's all part of why it's so hard for people to find work. So, Fat, do you want to talk about maybe the perceptions and some of the issues that can get in the way for people with disabilities finding work no matter what stage of life they're at? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think Dominique has really touched on that perception um, idea really well in her own personal experience. But I think in a wider context, um, perceptions are so powerful and often, unfortunately, in a, in a kind of negative way. Um, so when we look at employment, I think um, just in terms of negative perceptions, some of these can come from employers and current workplaces. And these have been building over, I think, decades and decades of time where it's actually not normal for um employers to actually employ people with disability. And by that, I mean, there haven't been many people with disabilities in the workforce. So what you've got is, you know, a process where it's going to take a long time to change these negative perceptions. So what do we mean by negative perceptions? I think it can start from, you know, perceptions from an employer thinking that it's going to cost too much money um, to to actually adapt a workplace in order for someone with a physical disability, perhaps a wheelchair user, for, for example, to, to actually access the building. Um, you know, there may be this negative perception um, that, you know, it's going to cost too much to change and make technical modification. I think also um, just from an, an employer's perspective, um, there may be a negative perception people with uh, disabilities may take additional leave because they have additional requirements requirements, you know, in terms of maintaining, you know, health appointments, things like that. A lot of the work we do is, you know, trying to bust those misperceptions or misconceptions um, and really work with employers to really get across um, the reality that it's actually not the case. You know, employing people with disabilities is not much different to employing someone, you know, who does not have a disability. And the things that I think can sometimes come across as challenging, you know, in the minds of an employer um, in the sense of having a fully accessible bathroom, for example, which is a huge issue um, if you are a person with a, a in particular, a physical disability. There's a lot of support um, and government funded support in, you know, to enable you to make the changes at no cost whatsoever to yourself as an employer. Um, and a lot of employers don't see or, you know, they're not aware of these resources that are available to them. You know, we're talking about the challenges that people face um, and they're not just coming from the um, from the employer's perspective and the workplace perspective as well. Um, Dominique touched on her personal experience and I think, you know, my experience working with people with physical disabilities and supporting them to find work. One thing that I've seen as a huge barrier is actual confidence levels and the the way, you know, some of these job seekers living with disabilities themselves um, I just lack confidence to actually start the job search process in the first place. So you've obviously got people with congenital um, disabilities, um, but you've also got people who are going through or have been through traumatic injury. And that in itself, you know, takes a person through a, a myriad of um, different challenges. To restart your life um, after an injury is one thing, but to then try and refocus your goals and try and actually get back to a career, try and get back onto the employment pathway um, is a completely different challenge in itself. So, you, you know, you're not only dealing with your, challenge, uh, your health challenges, but you're also dealing with um, these perceptions that are out there in the community and in the workforce about 
um, you know, people with disability returning to work. So if you're already on this low um, gauge of confidence in yourself, and you're also actually having to think about how other people perceive you, I think that's a double-edged sword. What we found in our experience is if you don't support and help people to engage with, um, I guess, their mental health fitness, the likelihood of them, in, you know, successfully navigating what can be quite a long and challenging job search process is less likely, especially if you're going through trauma, if you're going through, if you've been through a traumatic experience, being positive is not always the answer. There are challenges that, you know, uh, confront us whether we have disabilities or not, but certainly if you've been through a traumatic um, injury experience, um, Sometimes the last thing you want to hear is, you know, be positive, be positive. And I think that's actually not the answer. What we try and do is be realistic, embrace the challenges that they have for what they are. Now that we're in COVID, we're like in year two slash three. It's really highlighted a couple of things. One, people are going to take time off because they have COVID or because they're sick or something like that. And that is going to be universal to anybody in the world who is employed anywhere. Um, and secondly, because we've all worked from home from two, for two years or more than two years, we've actually done a pretty good job working from home. Like right now, Dominique is in South Australia, Fat's in somewhere on the beaches somewhere, and I'm in Greater Sydney. And we've all come together to record this episode because we have that access now to this sort of technology. Like my desk during this time, I, I was able to get funds from the NDIS to be able to upgrade my desk. Like we've got so many opportunities to be able to work from home, which I don't know. I mean, are employers taking advantage of that to be able to employ people with disabilities more so or keep that in the front of their minds? And should they be? I mean, they absolutely should be. Have you have you noticed any changes or is there anything we need to really like keep discussing? Because I feel like COVID's not going to end anytime soon and neither is working from home. And it's just a really good opportunity for people with disabilities to actually get into the workforce properly. What are your thoughts? I think um, I think that's a really good point to raise, Susan, because um, this whole, co you know, this COVID world that we now find ourselves in, whether we like it or not, um, has has forced change. And I think for, for a lot of people, um, that change is positive. You know, there's obviously um, certain challenges that uh, the new environment has um, has provided for us. But you know, we, we've got to talk about this increased flexibility. And I think it's not just for the general working population, but in particular for people with disabilities. Um, now, you know, I think when we're talking about opportunities for people with disabilities, I think it's important to say that not everyone wants to work from home. And I think it's important to kind of establish that way of thinking because, you know, there's a real benefit to employment and that is being out in the community, um, building your social connection, your new networks, making friends and all that kind of stuff. And, and sure, you can do that in a, a virtual world. It's really good to have jobs that maybe have a mixture of being in the office and, and being uh, potentially working from home. I saw a recent um, stat uh, in a in a Seek, um, you know, the online uh, employment uh, vacancies platform, um, that that basically said that there'd been an increase um, of adverts incorporating a work from home element of twenty percent, and I think that's only going to grow. So if you're talking about a traditional approach to employment where you had your office and you had your employees and they came in, they sat at a desk and often at a cubicle and, you know, they sometimes spoke to their colleagues or didn't. Um, and then, you you know, you, you change that philosophy and start, you know, working with an open plan office. And then COVID came along and COVID essentially has really woken up employers um, to, you know, the their approach to how they um, structure their offices and whether they have offices or not. So um, my wife, for example, she works for an organization um, who, you know, has employees in different countries, um, in different time zones. Um, and, you know, people are either permanently working from home 
or um, you know have a mixed hybrid model. So you know when we align that to how that impacts on the journey to work for people with disabilities and particular physical disabilities, it really opens up a, a whole sea of um, opportunities. And I think that's a, a real benefit that we've seen over the past couple of years because we've increasingly engaged with employers who um, are more flexible. Um, and allowing, you know, opportunities for people to, you know, spend maybe one, two, three days working from home. Um, and with the, the actual support you can get to um, get set up um, working from home with adaptive technologies, it's really, you know, become, you know, a positive for uh, creating new opportunities of employment for people with uh, disabilities. You also raised a very good point earlier, Dominica, about uh, roles where your critical thinking was like, well, where is my career um, trajectory? Where am I going to go after this job? And will I be able to, I guess, climb that career ladder? That is something that I think about all the time when it comes to disability and employment, because you don't really see a lot of people with disabilities in leadership roles, unless for some reason it's a company that is directly connected to something about disability because we're this episode is basically about breaking down the barriers. Can we kind of talk a little bit about how the importance of having people with disabilities in organizations that have nothing to do with disability and what that means for other people with disabilities when they're like looking for jobs that they want to see? Does anybody want to talk to that? I think, you know, it just touches on um, much more than employment itself. It touches on a culture and the way we or um, society as general perceives disability. I can pretty much guarantee that anyone with a physical disability at some point in their life got that kind of look that was a little bit of a almost a, a look of shock or look of a, you know <laughs> judgment perhaps you know that kind of that kind of look when when someone really seems to be you know judging you based on based on what you physically can or cannot do and I think that's just for many many years that's just been so many unhealthy perceptions of what's possible for someone uh, with a physical disability. I was fortunate enough to uh, to meet someone who was a CEO of a company that was not a disability specific company, and uh, and she was in a wheelchair and she was doing a fantastic job and there was absolutely no reason why she wouldn't. <laughs> uh, she was perfectly qualified for the job and it was it was fantastic to see. It was fantastic to see. Um, I think it's it's for someone who's living with physical disability, being able to see other co-workers um, and colleagues who also live with physical disability, that's, that's fantastic because suddenly you're not the odd one, <laughs> for lack of a better word. You know, you're not the only person uh, that... Um, that is not fully able-bodied. There is basically a level of normalizing disability in a workplace. And I think it's very exciting to see that there is a shift of perception uh, that, you know, people with disability don't necessarily need to be in the roles that are really hidden somewhere. There shouldn't be anything uh, that stops someone uh, with a disability from, you know, becoming a doctor, becoming a teacher, becoming a a CEO, becoming a, a, you know, a manager. So like you were mentioning before, Fat, it only takes little adjustments in the workplace. Could be a desk, could be a bathroom, you know, could be a car park. These little adjustments make such a significant difference to somebody with a disability trying to find work or wanting to even vet you as an employer, I guess, at the same time. And I think um, just to that point, um, ignorance is sometimes bliss. So, you know, if you're an employer living in a world where you've never employed a person with disability, it's easier for you to continue down that path. Uh, you know, I think it's because um, maybe you, you know, you, you're happy with the decisions that you made before um, and you think that that is the best way to operate. Um, the reason why I say that is because what, I guess the antidote to that is information and the right information. And the good thing is, you know, with the things like, uh, you know, the government provided disability gateway, all of the right information is out there. It's just a case of almost having, being brave enough to kind of step out of your comfort zone as an employer 
and access this information. Um, and as you know, as we've said, it's it's decades. We're working against decades, if not centuries, of uh, discrimination and misperceptions, misconceptions uh, on disability. And I think we almost need to embrace the fact that this is a long journey. It's not something that's going to change overnight. And if we embrace the information and we make the small changes over time, that's cultural change. All these things come together to create positive cultural change. And, you know, we, there are some great organizations out there that are really fighting the good fight. And I think, sadly, disability employment statistics are still showing that you know people with disabilities are facing a challenge getting into work and um you know that's uh i think that's evidence that more needs to be done we just need to keep it going we need to keep this conversation going because um we can't let this opportunity of this era that we're in where you know we've got increased flexibility um within work practices um and a great opportunity that is increasing job availability for people with uh, disabilities. It's what's really important is to is to being aware of what uh, you know a negative self-talk might look like of what might some might be some of the things that really get in a way and how to how to challenge that and how to build a resilience how to build a resilience where that perfect job and that perfect application actually doesn't end up uh, you know, resulting in unemployment um, because you know the uh, the difficult thing about job search, and that's um, that's the reality for a lot of people, not just people um, living with disability. Um, you know, I think it's it's quite unrealistic to expect that you know the very first job application it's always going to end up with that dream job and it's it's going to be perfect you know rejection is unfortunately part of the process when it comes to job search uh you know not every interview ends up being the successful interview not every application is perfect and it's not always easy to deal with rejection uh and having to having to navigate through that having to um build that resilience, I think it's really important. Having enough support, uh, you know, people to talk to, people to share that with, um, I think it's really important. And then I think also um, what's extremely important is doing a little bit of a research when it comes to, um, when it comes to not only the role, but also the organization, and, you know, the type of, the type of the role. I think when it comes to disability, it's quite often you know, very easy to concentrate on what's what's possible, and if if it's possible to make some adjustments, and the and the job is there, that's that's fantastic. But is this job also a good fit for that person? Is this company, is this culture also a good fit for that person? Or are they going to be dreading going to work? Um, and I think it's really too easy to to forget about that. But I think it's extremely important that uh, people find themselves. And the reason, I guess, where I wanted to highlight it is um, perhaps, you know, mention to someone that, no, you don't have to settle for a job that is not your, <laughs> not your ideal job just because it was offered or just because it was available. So I feel like this is now an opportunity for better representation in leadership. It's not necessarily the hybrid model, but you were talking earlier, Fat, about how this has now changed what jobs mean for employers, which also now changes what leadership means for employers. When you're talking to somebody else who's got a disability and they see somebody who's got a disability in a job that isn't progressing, they must think, or we, we can potentially think, well, that's, that's just going to be our future, right? Hmm. Absolutely. I think that's really a way of uh, challenging or taking out some of those perceived barriers and, you know, challenging some of that glass ceiling, which, um, which I think is really important. So we're, we're fighting against decades of discrimination. Um, to your point, Susan, change has to start from the top. So it's about leaders making decisions that are really going to help uh, initiate positive change. As you say, it's not just about education and about, you know, doing disability awareness training. Um, it's actually about just placing more people who are living with disability into the workforce. And what better example to actually do 
um, and achieve that to put someone, you know, into a senior position. And as you say, you know, if you're reflecting on someone's journey who is getting into work, has a really great skill set, um, lacks a bit of confidence, however, because of the journey that they've had as a person with disability, but can actually see, you know, a flagship example of someone who's actually already has lived the journey and has, has achieved their goals and is, you know, perhaps is on an executive leadership team or, you know, is is managing, uh, even managing a call center for example which um, you know is, a, is a, a different example of a leadership role i couldn't advocate enough for employers to actually really rethink their whole way of, of working to actually just consider people you know with physical disabilities at every level of the hierarchy it's about what um, uh, you know how the culture is actually um influenced uh, and I definitely agree with what Pat said about the change coming from the top um, because it's very very difficult to change it from the other way around. You've been listening to Have the Nerve, a podcast about disability. This podcast is brought to you by Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. This episode has been written, produced and edited by me, Susan Wood, logo art by Kobe Ann Moore. This podcast and other information about disability can be found on our resource hub. Come and pay us a visit at scia.org.au. And for more information about anything we've discussed, please check the show notes in the bottom of this episode. SCIA's Employability Program helps connect employers and people with physical disabilities together. Employability places job-ready candidates into meaningful work. If you want to know more about our service, please visit employability.org.au. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please consider giving us a five-star review. It'll really help get the information we discuss and the people who share their stories the attention it deserves. And if you're feeling super generous with your time, share this podcast with everyone you know on social media and tag Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. Once again, thank you for listening.